I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. You know, from time to time, I'll give a talk that has a kind of list in it. And it can feel like a lot to pay attention to. Oh my gosh, so much to remember, so much to understand. And I do tend to sort of move right along uh, for better and for worse. Um, it's understandable if, if it can feel like a lot to pay attention to or remember. And you could blow it off if it doesn't feel right to you. All that said, the Buddha certainly had a fair number of lists. And he called people in the first of the eight elements in the Eightfold Path to developing wise view, wise understanding of things. Um, you know, there's a place for conceptual understanding. And there's a, definitely a place for helping that conceptual understanding gradually become felt and a knowing increasingly in your bones, under your skin, in the best possible ways. Uh, a little story here about the Dalai Lama. My one encounter with him in person, 30-ish uh, years ago, Spirit Rock Meditation Center, in a gathering with maybe 150 meditation teachers and and other people, such as myself at the time. And uh, he gave an amazing talk. There was a lot about it that was quite remarkable. And one little part I want to call out uh, had to do with a moment that made the front page of the, uh, I think, the San Francisco Chronicle the next morning, in that he was holding forth you know, without any notes, just boom, very wonderful talk. And he mentioned at some point this important Tibetan teacher and a key book uh, that the teacher had, had written, you know, a, a thousand years ago, let's say. And he looked around the room and he saw that most people had no idea, me included, what he was talking about. So he paused and he looked around the room and he said, hmm. <laughs> that was it. He just said, hmm. <laughs> and yeah, we all felt like the principal <laughs> was chastising us. And then he said, study is important. It's important to study. It's important to understand. You know, don't be stressed about it, but do what you can in a regular way. And then he made this gesture that made the front page of the paper. He said, if you don't study, if you don't develop understanding, <laughs> you become like a little mouse. <laughs> And you don't know anything. So uh, there's a place. There's a place for, um, you know, putting up with lists, putting up with conceptual, pointing out instructions, and, and, you know, helping yourself in that process. All that said, fear not. Tonight and the next two talks will not be like that. And uh, in Zen, there's a famous Zen master called Gute. And... Gute was famous for having one finger Zen. Anything he was asked, complicated, simple, direct, I have no idea. Maybe, <laughs> what are we having for dinner, Sensei? Uh, he just held up one finger. That was it. He didn't give a big discourse, just held up one finger. And he was known as Gute, one finger Zen. Now, in that is a lot of teaching, right? Teaching of moving beyond words, teachings about oneness, teachings about maybe a question is kind of ridiculous, the person's just fooling around, trolling him in some way. Or maybe it's a kind of reminder of what we know already if we look inside. Well, I'm not Gute. I'm not a Zen master. I do have all my fingers, certainly. But here, I'm not going to offer one finger. I'm going to offer one word. One word. What is the word? The word is already. That's my one word teaching. Already. We will be exploring tonight and in the next two weeks how to feel 
how to know in your body, in the present, that's the key, in the present, that you are already at peace, already content, and already love. So let's approach this here and now, in the present, as an experiential exploration. So as soon as we face that word already, it brings us into the moment. Asking yourself a question like, oh, what is already true? Or what do I already feel? Brings you into the present. So let's just take a few moments right now to be aware of what is already happening in your experience. So I'll be quiet for about half a minute. Just be aware of what is already the case in what you are experiencing now. What did you notice is already the case in your experience? You probably noticed quite a few things. Uh, the mind is complicated. Think of the neural substrates of consciousness. You know, we have about 85 billion neurons amidst another 100 billion or so support cells. And, you know, consciousness is supported by a lot of neurology. So, you know, give or take, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 billion neurons. Average neuron is connected at, you know, several thousand synapses with other neurons. So we're talking a few, you know, trillion at least synapses involved in consciousness. And they're, you know, they form little nodes, little networks. So that's the neural basis that's complicated and made of parts. Well, Consciousness itself, our experience is complex. It's made of parts and it's dynamic. So that's what's already true. That's what's already the case. Um, you are a process, right? With many parts that are connected and changing. Huh, wow. And so let's pause for a few moments and see what it's like to feel this as what is already always true. Even to say it to yourself, I'm a process made of parts that are connected and changing. Rick said so. <laughs> so I'll be quiet, a little reflection. What's it like to regard yourself, you know, this body right now, you could say that, or kind of your life in general as a process made of many parts that are connected and changing, connected to each other and connected to the wider world and continually changing. What's it like to recognize that this is actually the case? If you're like me, you, you might find some humor in it, <laughs> in this vision of myself as this kind of messy swirling of flotsam and jetsam, <laughs> loosely associated <laughs> with itself, swirling down the river of time, jostled by countless other currents. <laughs> That's kind of humorous. Or There's a humility in it too. Wow. I the purported I is not entirely in charge. <laughs> some healthy humility, maybe some reassurance and relief. Letting this one in, okay? Process made of parts changing and letting it be true, recognizing that it is true. 
It's all right that it's true. What's the impact of letting it be all right that you are a messy process, <laughs> like me, with many parts mainly out of your control and swirling along in, t in the river of time? I don't know about you. <laughs> For me, there's a moment of panic and then a lightening up because what else can we do to, but surrender to that fact? All right. So going forward then, to use a different metaphor, we're each like a mosaic with many tiles. Right? Mosaic. Mind is a mosaic, many tiles. Body is like a mosaic, many, many tiles. Our life in the present, it's like a big mosaic with many, many, many tiles. And then our life to date. Wow, what a mosaic. <laughs> That's a really big one, okay? Many tiles. Now let's say that some of those tiles are beneficial, often enjoyable, wholesome, virtuous, good in a broad sense, okay? And let's say also that some tiles are painful, um, nasty, uh, mean, hateful, contracted, um, addicted, uh, unpleasant. We'll call those not so good. And then some are kind of neither. They're sort of in between. They're kind of neutral. So the mosaic, let's say, to simplify, has got green tiles, red tiles, and gray tiles. All right? So then, question for you. When you just kind of let yourself be, and maybe even let your mind wander a bit, while staying lightly aware of where that wandering goes, where does your mind tend to go? Which kind of tiles does attention typically get drawn to? Most people, me included, because we have human DNA and a human brain, and we're going to get to that in a second here, most of us tend to focus on the red tiles in the mosaic of consciousness, you know, like the threats or that upset with somebody or that concern or that frustration or that problem to solve. We tend to go there, right? Understandable. That's what the body evolved to do. That's the brain's so-called negativity bias. And if you haven't heard that phrase before, um, I would check it out. A lot of research about it. I've written a lot about it, implications. Short version is that we have a brain that's like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for good experiences, even though experiences of what we want to grow inside, which are usually good, are really important to pay attention to and internalize. Okay? So it's really interesting where attention tends to go. And even if uh, most of what is already true in your mind in your body and in your environment and even in your life is flashing green. Now to be really clear, sometimes uh, it's mainly red. You know, you've experienced a shocking loss perhaps, uh, you suddenly are, are, are in touch with someone you lost even years ago and you're just awash in grief again, it's real. Maybe there's chronic pain, it floods you. Maybe uh, moderate to severe depression is just fully flooded your awareness. <sighs> okay, sometimes it's like that. Sometimes you're just, you're outraged at something you, you know is happening in the news, even elsewhere in the world. <sighs> That's true, sometimes. But if it's, on the other hand, actually the case that in the present, most of the sensations in your body are neutral or pleasant. In the present, um, there's a background sense of well-being. If in the present, 
most of what you can be aware of is actually green, right? Then it's kind of delusional to become preoccupied with the red. And I'm gonna say more about this. So if you ask yourself, what's your global view of yourself as a whole, right? How do you see yourself? You know, a hot mess who once in a while is okay? Yeah. As someone who is struggling to make up for, quote unquote, some shameful mistakes you've made in your past? How do you, what's your global view of yourself as a whole? And I ask you, if most of what is true about you is good, is it not fair and appropriate to feel mostly good about yourself? I'm gonna say that again. If most of what is true about you is good, is it not fair and appropriate to feel mostly good about yourself? And can you help yourself feel deservedly mostly good about yourself? Um, I wanna give you a little personal example. You know, I've been looking a lot at um, things I've done in my life, um, for better or worse, and um, I know a lot of people who are parents uh, look back on their parenting and, you know, certain things stand out as you wince. You go, uh, I have those mo I have those times. You wince and you think, I sure wish I could have done that differently. I sure wish I knew then what I knew now, or I sure wish I had, um, you know, put on the brakes, or I sure wish I had not said that, and so forth. Okay, I got it. But here's an interesting way to consider this. Think about all the minutes of a child's life, let's say from birth to their 18th birthday, all right? And that's nearly 10 million minutes, all right? Uh, 18 years times 365 days times 1,440 minutes in a day. Just short of 10 million minutes. Now let's say that you'd really like to get back about 1,000 of them, okay? You would do it differently now. You're fully accepting responsibility for those thousand minutes. You're not minimizing them. And how are you going to judge yourself as a parent? Let's say it was even 10,000 bad minutes, 10,000 red minutes. Ugh. Are you going to judge yourself for the one-tenth of one percent of your time as a parent? Or are you going to judge yourself for the 99.9% .9 of your time as a parent when you were consistently in the green in everything related to raising your child, including providing for them, staying loyal to them, coming through for them, putting up with them, <laughs> putting up with everything related to them, like high school teacher conferences and everything, right? How are you gonna judge yourself? Are you gonna judge yourself in proportion to the green and the red? How about similarly in your occupation? If you look back on your career, or you look back on a marriage, or you look back on a friendship, or any other area of your life, maybe you look back on a relationship with someone who's become estranged with you because they're mad at some of the red minutes. Some of, the, some of your red minutes with them have They've had it with that. Wow. Wow. How many red minutes really were there? Your red minutes in that friendship. Whatever their part was as well. And yet they're going to throw you off the island? Now, sometimes there are certain red minutes, obviously, that have high impact. Of course, many green minutes, many green tiles in the mosaic have high impact too. And yeah, some people have had lives with a lot of red minutes, a lot of even mainly red minutes, harms done to others, things to be ashamed of. Okay, 
If that's true, that's true. We're exploring here what is already true. The past is what is already true. And what's the case in the present is what's already true. Right? When we look at the big picture of most of what has been the life of most people, like you, what do you see? I see manly green tiles. I see manly green minutes. Sincere efforts, decency, endurance in the face of really tough circumstances, including terrible injustice, racism, sexism, isms of various kinds, poverty, war, um, overcoming obstacles, green minutes, green tiles, kindness to others, love, getting back up when you've been knocked down, learning, the you know, honoring the longings in the heart for awakening. That's what I mainly see. So if your life has been mostly good, should you not feel mostly good about your life? And that means standing up to the brain's autopilot, its negativity bias that fixates on the red minutes, the red tiles, and um, is biased to downplay, dismiss, overlook, push aside the rest. And let's be really, really clear. We need to see the red tiles. No one was more clear-eyed about the red minutes, the red tiles, than the Buddha. 2,500 years ago, Northern India with patriarchy, slavery, wars. He was raised as in a warrior caste uh, with a local feudal, you know, property owner and so forth and his, you know, the head of his clan. That's what it was like. He looked out there and saw disease, famine, and all the rest. A lot of red minutes. A lot of red minutes. We can be clear about all that while at the same time asking ourselves, Am I seeing the whole picture of what is also already true? And am I cultivating the capacity to rest more and more in the green to deal with the red? You know, slow down and let this kind of sink in. If your life has been mostly good, should you not feel mostly good about your life? If how you've conducted yourself today, if your conduct today, your volitional actions, which the Buddha emphasized in thought, word, and deed, have been mostly good today, should you not feel mostly good about your day? Should you not feel mostly good about yourself today? You know what I'm saying is logical. You know what I'm saying is true. And yet, it's so hard to stay with it, isn't it? It's so hard to let this knowing sink in and soften the heart and bring reassurance and ease and relief and benediction and blessing and comfort to ourselves, not as a, not as a narcissistic free pass, you know, in life, um, but rather as an embodied knowing of what is actually already true. Why is it so hard? You think it, we'd, you know, we want to do it, but no, we don't, right? What's going on with this? Now, the Buddha pointed out that our natural true state, already in the present, is hidden by three things in particular. <clears throat> Greed and hatred, these are broad traditional terms, greed and hatred, you can broaden them out. And in particular, delusion, the deep root of the other two poisons. You could think of these also as fuels, which is a traditional metaphor in Buddhism and perhaps other cultures, fuels of the fires of suffering, the fuel of greed, the fuel of hatred, which includes fear and anger, and the the root fuel of delusion, misunderstanding, ignorance, not recognizing what is actually already true. These three poisons, these three fuels, tend to operate continuously in the background of the ordinary mind. In subtle ways, habitually, they prime and condition us toward craving. 
which is the second noble truth. Uh, and these poisons surge to the forefront under particular circumstances to intensify and focus our craving as we fixate on the red tiles, the red minutes. Now, biologically, this is Mother Nature's plan because <laughs> it's a great evolved strategy to keep her little babies alive in the wild, in Jurassic Park, in the primordial seas, you know? Wow, I, I watched a wonderful documentary, if you haven't seen it, uh, my, my Octopus Teacher, but this really sweet and highly intelligent and social octopus befriended by this um, skin diver off the coast of South Africa. And um, eventually, you know, there's a natural lifespan to the octopus. And, and along the way, the, um, uh, toward the end, they just mentioned the, the fact that a typical octopus will probably have maybe thousands of eggs that will hatch into little baby octopi. And most of them will not live more than a few days before they're eaten. Certainly not live more than a few weeks or months. This, whew, you know? So in that context, Mother Nature's divine strategy is to keep us on our toes, is to keep us in a state of perpetual craving, fixated on the red tiles, the red minutes. And this is craving based on a, it's a, as a drive state, it's based on a deficit something missing or wrong in the meeting of an important need. And this takes us toward the practices that are liberating that we're going to be talking about here. Like all animals, we have three major needs, to be safe and satisfied and connected, broadly stated as umbrella terms. It probably has some other needs, maybe kind of, sort of, that don't neatly fit into that framework, but you can fit a lot of biology and a lot of ordinary human psychology today into the heading of those three needs, to be safe, satisfied, and connected. Okay. When we truly feel and know that we are already safe and satisfied and connected in the present, craving shuts off or at least it dials down a lot. And it's easier to see that there is no actual basis for the craving that remains as a kind of habit, maybe in the background of the mind. There's no actual basis for it. Still, that's remarkably hard to do, isn't it? Even when we actually already are safe enough in the present, satisfied enough in the present, and connected enough in the present, delusional craving continues because that's Mother Nature's autopilot to keep us on our toes, to never let us feel reassured, fully safe, fully satisfied, fully connected, even when there's the complete basis already for feeling this in the present, within the releasing of craving. You know, delusional craving keeps on going with the engine, the associated engine of greed, looking for problems to solve. You know, your my mind is continually scanning by habit. I'm working on it. It's getting better for the next problem to solve. I've got my to-do list. I'm working my way through my to-do list every day. What's the next problem to solve? Or what's the next opportunity to capture? You know, it's a kind of mental foraging, the equivalent of animals in the wild, always looking for something new to eat, something new to want. Greed looking for things to possess and frustrations and losses to overcome, the engine of greed, autopilot. You can be aware of this in yourself, including kind of mildly, but it just keeps on ticking. It's like the idling, tick, tick, tick of the engine of the mind, biologically determined. What about the engine of hatred? Scanning for threats, scanning for actual or potential pain, scanning for adversaries and rivals, and fights to have, and things to flee, automatically. You know, in the wild and in our life today, there are two kinds of mistakes, broadly. On the one hand, we can think that things are bad when they're actually good. We can think that there's a tiger about to pounce when in fact there's no tiger. That's one kind of a mistake. 
Then in the wild and in our life today, there's another kind of mistake in which we think everything's good, but actually something bad is about to get us. Two kinds of mistakes, yet the consequences are very different in the wild and in our life today. Uh, the consequence of the first mistake is needless anxiety. We're contracted, we're caught up in craving. The cost of the second mistake, life and death sometimes. So we're designed to make the first mistake thousands of times to avoid making the second mistake at all. I call that paper tiger paranoia. This is our biology. You can be aware in your own mind, habitually, this background trickle or sometimes flood of anxiety related to our need for safety, this background trickle of uh, chasing rewards or background trickle of insecurity in your relationships. And you might find that, you know, sorry, all three of <laughs> these rivers are surging through your mind or trickling, at least in the background. Or you might find, as I have found, that one in particular is, wow, really keeps on <laughs> broadcasting. I mean, for me, it's related to the need for contentment or satisfaction. I actually don't have much going on about feeling safe enough and nor do I have much going on about feeling loved and connected enough, but have I accomplished enough? Have I done enough? Uh, have I, you know, um, been a productive enough boy today? Uh, those habits, you know, socialized in, from our family background and culture uh, and our, you know, tendencies. We can learn to be really good at dealing with threats, so we kind of orient then a lot around threat management, or we can be really good at managing issues in relationships, so we get kind of focused there, or we can be really good at producing results in the world, accomplishing tasks and, you know, getting stuff done, um, like in my case, and then it gets rewarded and it becomes the habit of your brain. So then you have to work gradually, as I'm doing, in deconditioning yourself from that. So how do we do that? That's what I want to talk about now. Um, it's really important to appreciate that this is Mother Nature's plan. It's what Paul Gilbert calls our tricky brain, tricksy, uh, our precious brain, right? And understanding this in our common humanity and kind of normalizing it or about other people, maybe we can see it more in other people. Why do they keep worrying about that? You know, we don't worry about it. Why do they worry about it? Well, interesting, because they're designed to worry about it by Mother Nature in their particular case, applied in their particular case. So it's helpful to appreciate that this is Mama, Mama Nature's plan, well intended, to keep us on our toes. And it's a strategy that really works when we're truly not safe, truly uh, desperate for satisfaction, uh, including getting enough food to eat, uh, or really being mistreated and pounded on by other people. Mother Nature's strategy is a good one. But on the other hand, what if it's actually true? That in your life, there's mostly the basis for feeling safe enough in the present and to feel um, peaceful in the core of your being with calm strength, even while you deal with challenges to safety. What if that's true? What if it's true that you, whew, can already feel amazingly grateful and glad about what you have already, including compared to people in you know, a decade ago, a century ago, a millennia ago, you know, and already connected enough. What do you, how can you disengage from delusional craving and rest at peace in the present? Well, the Buddha had a strong suggestion Thank you, Buddha. Thank you. And he pointed out that this process of craving is mostly future-oriented in the sense that it is endlessly directed at becoming. Becoming free of a particular threat, becoming uh, one who has accomplished a goal, becoming one who is who impresses other people and is loved by everyone, whatever it might be, becoming. There's this leaning into the future 
rather than resting in the present. And that's why when I suggested in the meditation that you consider what it's like to not know as a way of disrupting the engines of becoming, the habits of becoming, uh, it opens up a space where we can more rest in simply being in the present. So as we disrupt the machinery of becoming, we start paying more attention to what is already the case in the present. This might sound kind of abstract, but you can watch it. You just let your mind run a little bit and then sort of, you know, uh, do the instant replay of the last minute or uh, few seconds. And you'll see that so much of your imagination, so much of your rumination, it's, it's future-focused. If it's even about the past, there's a kind of becoming in ruminating about the past in that we want to become free of the past. We want to become at peace about the past. We want to come to terms w with our mistakes in the past. You know, uh, the, we, we are, We're bringing a wishfulness to the past that's about becoming. So you can help yourself a lot. The Buddha talked about this a lot, about mindfulness of becoming. And what is it like in meditation to pull out of the habit of becoming? Now, this is hard because the brain is a prediction generator. A lot of neuroscience is about the generation of expectations, of predictions, and then we're matching um, present moment information against the prediction that our brain previously made and trying to learn from that and then going forward. So we're still continually generating expectations and predictions. There's a place for that. There's a place for mental time travel, for reviewing the past and trying to learn from it, for planning your future. There's a place for that. But you can just be aware of the, of the, of the relationship in your own experience between the leaning into becoming and the contracted, tense, felt sense of craving. Which instead of feeling at peace, feels fearful or angry or helpless, right? Becoming in terms of satisfaction is associated with drivenness, frustration, disappointment, addiction. The felt sense of becoming in the related craving applied to our need for connection is a preoccupation, is feeling insecure, like insecure attachment and other experiences like uh, low worth or envy or ill will, vengeance, cruelty, fantasies of punishing them. You can be aware of that related to becoming and craving together. So what's the alternative? Back to that one word, already. When we recognize that we are already basically okay, for at least a second or longer, it pops the bubble. We wake up from the spell of delusional craving, autopilot craving, baseless craving. We, I'm actually basically all right. In this, this moment is mostly green. <laughs> you know, I still need to get stuff done. I need to, in my case, take the garbage out tonight and all the rest of that. And, you know, um, it's okay. I've got some social tasks. They're perfectly fine with my wife to come. It's fine. And we don't need to feel fearful or angry or helpless as we, you know, get stuff done, do things, because we feel already full, already enough. So having laid this foundation, which includes some major teachings of the Buddha, he offered them to us as liberating um, 
paths and forces in our own life. They're worth our engagement, these teachings. So having laid this foundation here, next week I'm going to, I'm going to particularly focus on our need for safety and related issues of anxiety, uh, fearfulness, uh, the impact of trauma, sense of helplessness, and even dissociative responses to feeling really threatened. And all we can do is just escape in our own minds and go away. And then the one after that, I'll focus on um, bringing the good news of what is already true to our tendency to um, you know, chase after various goals and rewards in terms of satisfaction. And I'll focus on bringing the sense of being already liked, already loved, already good enough, already virtuous in your relationships. None of which means becoming complacent. In fact, <laughs> being flooded with paper tiger paranoia makes it a lot harder to deal with real threats. You free up a lot of energy for being more successful in your career and work uh, if you're not caught up in uh, the tension and frustration and disappointment and anticipatory disappointment of always having to be a super duper top performer today and whatever happened yesterday is not relevant and whatever you do today just goes away when you gotta go back tomorrow. You know? Okay, so uh, to finish here, I really invite you to bring into your present moment practice a return again and again to ask yourself, huh, what is actually already true in what you're feeling, in your circumstances, in your conduct, in your heart? What is actually already true deep down inside you in your own fundamental nature? The Buddha said what is actually already true in our deep nature is a fundamental freedom of, from reactivity, fundamental freedom from greed and hatred as um, ignorance, as the clouds of delusion and ignorance are gradually dispelled by the clear sunlight of deep understanding that is felt and brought into your life. It's good news. It's really good news. So I invite you to keep reflecting on what's already the case. If you see those, some red minutes, if you see some red tiles, deal with them as best you can. Um, and meanwhile, you know, keep recognizing the fullness of what is actually already true about you, your life, and your innermost being.